Romans chapter 10. I shall start reading from verse 5. Don't worry if you find this uh, hard to understand. I shall be explaining some of it later on. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that as we now come to look at your word, you would change us powerfully by your spirit, so that when we go home, we would not be the same people as when we came, but we would be changed by you. Amen. Well, do take a seat. And if you find your Bibles again, uh, turn back to Romans chapter 10. Be great help uh, to us both as, as we look at this together. Page 1137. 1137, Romans chapter 10. It is a really great pleasure to be with you uh, here this morning. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Wycliffe Bible Translators. We have a stand. Uh, I've got leaflets for everyone who wants one. We can actually put stuff in the post to you about what's going on around the world. That can happen another time. Instead, this morning, I've come to try and help you as a church with how to play your part in the work God has given all of us to do. So let me keep it simple. I just want to show you three things, just three things from the Bible reading. Firstly, speak. Because the gospel is by faith, we must speak. In this passage, Paul is demonstrating that the Bible consistently teaches that salvation is and always has been by faith, not works. That is to say, the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of sin and new life in Jesus, is not about what we do, but about what Jesus has done. Uh, In Paul's day, many people misunderstood the Old Testament, thinking it was about rules that we must obey. So Paul has been pointing out that Moses actually spoke of the need for righteousness that is by faith. Uh, received as a gift, that is, salvation that is done for us, not by us. Uh, For example, in verse 6, Paul quotes Moses saying, verse 6, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. You see, Christ came down from heaven already. We don't need to do good works to get us to heaven when he has come to us. Christ rose from the dead already. We don't have to earn a new life when he has achieved life for all who follow him. So if there is nothing for us to do, what is left? Verse 9, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel says that Jesus died for our sins, he was raised on the third day, and is now exalted in heaven as Lord. And if we believe that to be true in our hearts, if we take it to heart and believe it to be true, then we will speak of it with our mouths, that Jesus is Lord, and we will have entered into God's salvation. There is nothing to do. The gospel goes into our hearts and changes our lives. It saves us because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There is nothing for us to do except to receive, to welcome this good news. So now, get this. Here's the thing I wanted to show you. 
Imagine there are two people. Uh, one's a believer, the other is not. Uh, the, the unbeliever has never heard this message about Jesus. Suppose the believer sets preconditions on sharing the gospel. Suppose they say, before I'll tell you about Jesus, first you must become more like me. You need to dress like me and, and talk like me and behave like me and, and have some of the same interests as me. And only then, after you've jumped through my hurdles, will I tell you how to be saved. Now, that's ridiculous, right? But stay with me for a moment. If the believer did that, set preconditions on, on hearing the gospel, what would be the results? Well, the preconditions would change the very nature of the gospel itself because suddenly it is not about faith but about works then faith. If we make people jump through hurdles first, we're saying the gospel is no longer a free gift for which there is nothing to do, but you do something before you can believe. Friends, this is exactly what happens all the time. We are so used to it, we consider it normal. It is not just a distortion of the gospel and the way the gospel works. It is in contradiction to the gospel. Now, let me ask you, who are you most concerned to share the gospel with? Is it your friends, people like you? Is it your colleagues, people of similar professional status to you? Is it your sports team, people with similar interests to you? Is it your neighbors, people of similar economic status to you? Well, praise God for that. Yeah, me too. That, that's good, isn't it? But who is going to share the gospel with those who are not like us? I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm sorry, I'm just visiting. So, but I'm guessing if you were to get a map of Hull and plot where the evangelical Christians live, you would find whole neighborhoods with little witness, streets where no one knows a Christian compared to other parts where, where most Christians are grouped. Would that be about right? It is true for most cities. And so we say to people loud and clear that unless they relocate and come to be like us, they are excluded from opportunities to hear the gospel because the, the dominant group, uh, the Christians, set preconditions. We do want to share the gospel with you. you. You will enter our radar, but only when you first become more like us and enter our circles so that we share, speak to you or think globally. Um, so there's uh, over 300 million Muslims in North Africa and the Middle East, few of whom have ever met a Christian willing to share about Jesus. Now, maybe if some of those uh, uh, people came to visit Hull, maybe as international students, then maybe if they speak English, then we might have an opportunity to point them to Jesus. And that is good. But if that is all we do, if we reach students only when they visit this country but not in their home countries, then what are we saying? We're saying that to hear about Jesus, you must first learn English and second visit Britain. <laughs> If we don't learn their language and go to their countries, we're setting preconditions for them. We will share the gospel with you, but only if you first become more like us. It's as if the, the ambulance service had a policy that they'll take you to hospital if you first polish the shoes. Uh, or the fire brigade come and say, we'll put out your fire if you first bake us a cake. It, it just would be wrong, wrong to create barriers to something which should be offered freely. And it is the same with the gospel. It is to be offered freely. We must speak it without making people jump through hurdles first. Does that mean we should all relocate to different neighborhoods uh, or all start language classes and move overseas? Well, no, but it does mean that as a church, some of us should do it. And that all of us should be more concerned to see that between us, we make it happen. But before I come back to that, let's not miss the main point here, that we must share the gospel without creating hurdles. Or to put that the other way around, it is the job of the believers to reduce obstacles to hearing the gospel. Salvation is by faith alone, therefore we must speak of Jesus in a way which takes the message to all people so that they can receive it by faith alone. The burden of crossing cultures and crossing languages must be carried by the believer, 
not the unbeliever. It is the responsibility of believers to speak the news about Jesus to the people of this world on their home turf, in their mother tongue. Since the gospel is a message of salvation by faith alone, therefore it is inherent in the gospel that it must be spoken to people where they live in their language so that they can receive it by faith, not by works. That's my first point this morning, speak. Because the gospel is by faith, we must speak it to people where they are, how they are, without waiting for them to come to us or be like us first. Two more things I want to show you. Secondly, send. Because the gospel is for everyone, we must send workers. Let me read from verse 11. Verse 11, as scripture says, anyone who believes in him, in Jesus, will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you notice there how inclusive the gospel is? Paul uses words like anyone, all, everyone. There is one God, one saviour, one gospel for all people everywhere. Friends, do we believe that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved? Because in my job, I I meet people of different nationalities all the time and I keep finding the same thing. I, I meet Malaysians who think the gospel is only for Christian Malaysians and not for the Muslims. I meet Indians who think the gospel is really only for Christian Islam, Indians, and and not for the Hindus. And I meet Brits who think the gospel is for them and their friends and give little thought to the unreached people in this country, let alone in the rest of the world. Of course, no one ever says that to me, but that attitude must be somewhere within us if we keep the gospel for ourselves and our social group and don't have a major concern to see the gospel spread to every tribe and language and people and nation. The same gospel is for everyone. There's not different versions of the gospel in different places. And therefore, anyone who has the gospel, any believer, must think about making travel plans to take this gospel beyond those who've already heard it and out into the vast masses of people who have never had opportunity to hear it for themselves. Now, in reality, it's, it's not actually just as easy as getting on the next flight. For, I mean, for start, someone has got to pay for that flight. Uh, you need somewhere to live, which costs money. Uh, you need food, clothes, you know, perhaps a car. So those who go are going to need others to finance that work. What is more, on on arrival, you may find yourself feeling quite isolated. You you could be feeling lonely and homesick. Uh, You may be joining other uh, local Christians where you are, um, but they may not understand what it's like, what you're facing. You're going to need others who will pray for you and find practical ways of building friendship to support you at a distance. In short, for the gospel to be taken to all nations, for every person who goes, it needs a backup team to get them there and to keep them there. Paying, praying, supporting. Only a small handful of people have ever walked on the moon, but it takes loads of people on the ground at Mission Control to make it happen. Yeah, if the gospel were not so inclusive, if the gospel were just for a certain type of people, this wouldn't be such a big deal. But because the gospel is for everyone then it means leaving home, crossing cultures to take it to people where they are. And therefore, it is in the very nature of the gospel, which means believers are obliged to organize themselves into sending teams, to send those who will go and speak, to pay for them, to pray for them, and to support them with help, encouragement, and any practical assistance. Paul makes this connection explicit in our passage. Let's pick up again at verse 13. Verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wonderful. But how then can they call on the one of whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? 
How can anyone preach unless they are sent? How can anyone preach unless they're sent, says Paul? So often the sticking point in making Jesus known in our home countries and around the world is that there are too few people willing to be senders. If we think we can leave to others the task of sending gospel workers, of of paying for them, praying for them, and in every way supporting them, if we think we can leave that to a a small group of Christians who who have some specialized interest in world mission, what are we saying about ourselves? We're saying we haven't quite understood yet that the gospel is for everyone. Something in us isn't caring about the needs of this world. For some people, that does mean packing your bags and getting going. For everybody else, the responsibility of being senders rests upon those who remain the maths is, is, is really quite simple. For every full-time gospel worker, whether in the UK or overseas, to pay for them takes 10 people back home tithing their income, or you could say 50 people giving 2%. People sometimes ask me, uh, how many people does Wycliffe have working overseas? How much money do we pour into Bible translation? Uh, the answer is none. It is all church's people, it is all church's money. There is no other source of people or income except from churches like this who are committing to send and do this work. I mean, think about how much effort we each put into our holiday plans, searching for for deals, checking for accommodation, wanting everything to be just right, and that is just for ourselves. How much more seriously should we take the needs of those who have traveled around the country, around the world, not for their own sakes, but for the, sake of the, for, for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel, for the glory of Christ? Let me try and spell out for you what it looks like to be a sender and to be a sending church. It starts with the gospel It starts with the realization that we have been saved for free. And that leads to the desire within us to see others saved freely. And that produces a concern to partner with those who are sharing this gospel around the world. This is not motivated by guilt, but by grace, by the gospel. And here's my top tip for you. If you want to support a gospel worker, uh, Caroline uh, or or, or anyone else uh, the church supports, Set up a financial commitment. If you know someone great, if you don't pick one of the church mission partners, email them, ask to get their prayer letters. It's not clear how to do this, just just ask around. And send money, set up a standing order. If you don't have a lot of money, maybe you can only give a small amount. If you can afford to go to the cinema or the garden center, you you can give much more. It, It is incredible how liberating it is to pray for people when you are the one who is paying for their work. It is just very motivating. It's not just individuals. It's their missions organizations as well. Choose one you, you like the look of, Wycliffe or, or, or WEC or, or Gospel for Asia or whoever it is, whoever you like the look of, and send money. Because if you do that, you find that the people and the organizations you're partnering with, they send you news and updates that you can pray about. This is spiritual work, and so often the success of the workers depends on the prayers of the supporters. And what is more, then as we start entering into praying for people, we develop a greater concern for the needs of their, of the, for their lives. And when someone sends a prayer letter, we can email back a quick reply. So disheartening, actually, for, for mission workers to share their lives in a prayer letter and find no one bothers to reply. It only takes 30 seconds to send a one-line response. We find out when their birthday is and make sure they're remembered. We find out what their worries are and what we can do to help. And I know that St. John supports mission partners as a church, But as a church, can I urge you not to leave this to the mission committee? If every individual in the church built a personal link with one mission partner, it would make a tremendous difference to the sustainability and effectiveness of their work. Paul says of mission partners, how can anyone preach unless they are sent? It's a call for churches to be senders, paying for their work, praying for their work, and in every way supporting their work. So three practical points to take home with us. Firstly, speak, because the gospel is by faith. We must speak it to people where they are, how they are. Secondly, send, because the gospel is for everyone. We must send workers, paying, praying, supporting. 
And now thirdly, go. Because the gospel is needed, some must go. It's all very well talking about sending, but who is going to go? Remember what the passage said, verse 14? How can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? As verse 15 ends, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That the beautiful life is not the aspirational living of the glossy magazines. Someone sent me a glossy watch magazine. I'd never seen anything like it before. Full of these really handsome models wearing these beautiful watches, kind of exquisite timepieces, many handmade. A new watch was being reviewed, and it was a bottom-of-the-range kind of beginner sort of watch, costing, I quote, a very reasonable £1,000. That is not a beautiful watch. That is not a beautiful life. Bringing good news of salvation to those who are dying without her saviour, that's a beautiful thing. When my wife and I years back were were travelling out to be uh, missionaries in Kenya, training church leaders there, the near universal assumption was that we were doing this because we like travelling. As if the only reason for going overseas was to gain new life experiences... I mean, who cares about that? No. What is needed is for some to go who understand that the reason we cross cultures is the free salvation offered in Jesus and the urgent need to get this message out to all people while there is time before it is too late. So who will go? Will someone here this morning go? It doesn't take any particular skills. Anyone who believes the gospel is qualified by God to share the gospel. For some, it starts with reaching out to people in our own communities or or, or in neighboring towns. Some of us with houses in the nice areas need to consider moving to a less nice area for the sake of those who will not otherwise hear. Can you use your work skills in a different part of the world? Within Wycliffe Bible Translators, one of our pressing needs at the moment is not just for uh, more sort of recent graduates and, and translator linguists, though we need more of those. We are crying out for people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s with any management, financial, or leadership experience to come and help us run projects so that translators can be freed up to get on with the work. Missions organizations need people with a range of skills, teachers, administrators, programmers, medics, HR. God can use any background. And these people of all ages, from early 20s through to retirement and beyond. One of the very great needs in the world today is for people to relocate to support local Christians who are trying to reach out to their communities and plant churches. Will anyone here quit work, retrain, and go and help our brothers and sisters to share the gospel in their nations? Will some here take early retirement in order to go? And the rest of us, we're not looking for Lone Ranger heroes. We don't want you to go without us. We want to send you to partner with you in the work. We want some to go so that those who stay can commit to paying for you, praying for you, and supporting you. But we can't send unless some people go. Who will it be? Let me finish by reading from verse 13. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let's pray. Father God, we praise and thank you that you have revealed the gospel to us, unworthy sinners. We thank you for those who have spoken your words to us and who took the trouble to point us to Jesus, that today we can be here enjoying full forgiveness and free salvation and all the benefits and joy that come from new life in Jesus. We pray that you would give us far greater concern to see others given the opportunity to hear and receive this good news for themselves. Stir us up that together we might become better senders, 
paying for, praying for, and supporting existing mission partners and organizations. And Lord, raise up more workers for this great task. Raise up more workers for this great task. For the honor and glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen.